I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample-tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. This is a very special segment for me because I'm with my friend, Megan Griffiths, Hello. the director of the film Eden, which is premiering Premiering? Premiered yesterday. Premiered. Yes. Let's get our tenses right. <laughs> I was never good at the English. Yeah. So that you, you can correct me as we go along if I, I will. have other tenses. Believe tense me, issues. I will. I have parents who corrected my grammar, so yeah. I do that to people. It's they annoying. tried to do it to me, but at some point <laughs> it just like became white noise. Um, which it was a very exciting thing for me, honestly, because I honestly didn't know what was happening until I got the like schedule for the festival and it was like, Megan did another film? That's I awesome. Did. Because I remember how long it took you to get off hours then and how excited I was when that finally came to fruition because it was years in the making. It sort of became a, a rallying cry, I feel like, in Seattle, like help totally. get the off hours made. Uh, I mean, I remember going to those parties for years in support of I it. No, we really, we really were trying but for But it was, so, it was so exciting and it was like, oh, finally, all that hard work to come to fruition. And then it was sort of like, wait a minute, like, how'd she do that so fast the next time? Like, what was the magic that you caught with Eden that you weren't able to catch with the off hours? It came was to it me with fundra fundraising already done. Really? Yeah. That's... So because you were like so it, such I... a like a badass after the off hours, they're like, "Hey, we got this script for you, Megan." You're like, "I'll entertain it." Yeah, basically. <laughs> no, you're, you're Hollywood now. I'm super Hollywood. Um, no, uh, Colin worked on the off hours, the producer of Eden. Oh, really? Yes, and uh, and so we met that way, and then uh, when we got when I left Sundance, he came to me and said, "I've been developing this script with my friend Rick, who the original writer Rick Phillips." Um, and uh, and I read it and I liked the story, so I jumped on board and it was a real uh, freight train um, of production. Like we we started working on it in April last year. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I remember like the off hours. Was, I don't know if it. Where did the off hours premiere? Sundance. So it. I mean, I remember you still promoting that like April or May or whenever SIF is. Um, which was I still I'm I still, still promote it, it. I still promote it now. It's on VOD, so I know I'm still oh, like, I, trying I, to get I got, people I, to watch it. I proudly got my little IFP screener of it that I tried. You did, yeah. yeah the Spirit Award nominee for Ben Kasulke. That's pretty. That's yeah, You know, he's everywhere. That's a good yeah. choice. You know. Yeah. Um, Deserving. It's kind of it's neat that you had somebody who was thinking of you in terms of your next project. It was yeah. Amazing. When he brought this to you though, what was your initial reaction? Because this is a really heavy project. I mean, the off hours isn't like you know like slapstick fall over the chair comedy. You didn't think? <laughs> no, it's but, definitely like this is a different. But film th this is this is like, like this is like depressing at times. I mean, it's it's a rough. It? I don't know. I mean, I it, I know it's it's, like, a it's heavy subject matter, but I feel like it's like. It moves so much that, that I don't ever feel like it falls into well, like a depressing. I agree story. with you that the thing that I think I found depressing. I mean, it's a true story. Yeah. Like that is like depressing that it happens at all. Yeah, yeah. it happens at all, and you know specifically. And I mean, you've met the person that it happened to in this case. I mean, I was talking with Matt just a minute ago, and it's sort of like you know you you hear about this kind of stuff in foreign countries, but you never think about it. In America, and so to like hear hear it happening in America, hear this harrowing story is like it's it's got to be kind of a tough script to go through and read and be like, yes, this is the film that I can see imagining in my mind. Cause yeah, I mean, it's like this film when I first read it, completely recognized that it wasn't in my wheelhouse up to that point, but that was one of the things I liked about it. I just I wanted to thought it would be a good way to test myself as a director and see what I was capable of and you know try something new and dealing with guns and violence and sex and um, you're kind of becoming a badass with the you know the action and the drama <laughs> I know, like I'm gonna make the next Mission Impossible or something uh, I, I, I'm promoting it starting right now like what are we at four I guess we just did yeah Mission Impossible 5 Megan Griffiths let's do this it's gotta be on IMAX though so you're gonna have to make that part of your wheelhouse I'm cool with a big camera I can do that yeah. um but yeah, no, I, I I don't know. It's just like I saw that I, I liked that like the challenge aspect of it, but also I just was really drawn to the Eden Vaughn core relationship. That was like for me as a person who is a character driven audience member you know I, I like to watch compelling characters and and complicated relationships and that relationship is like nothing if not incredibly complicated so uh, that was for me like I that was what I wanted to draw out of the script and really focus on and 
that's what the movie, that and Eden's journey are like what the movie is for you, me. You raise a good question though, and that is, um, it wasn't in your wheelhouse to begin with. As a director, how do you go about, you know, learning how to direct guns and stuff like that? Because, I mean, do you just, like, get some prop guns and start, like, filming shootouts? Or, like, <laughs> how, how exactly do you go about that? Because, you know, it is it is a definitely a different yeah. area I mean, of filmmaking. I, I do have a background, as you're aware, as an assistant director, and I've worked on a lot of other you, films. You've that... wrangled some people, I know that. Yeah, and I've worked on some heavy gunplay movies, yeah. too. Um, and... It, I'm always, I have uh, reservations about guns in general, and I don't like to have them around on set. So every gun that was in Eden, we had a lot of them on set all the time, was uh, completely non-functional, just just for show, and and uh, all the gunfire is is uh, is post, and that made me feel comfortable around them and able to direct and feel at ease and everything. But in terms of like you know showing it we just you know I just had people around who knew more about guns than I did mm. and could advise on how they're handled See, that's smart you need people <laughs> who know what they're doing to help I certainly you out. don't know anything about where like how you would hold a gun or what you would do with it I, I've stuff. watched enough movies to know it's sideways oh, that's, right. the, that's the kill I, shot we actually, I think we yeah. may have forgotten about the sideways thing <laughs> yeah, yeah. so maybe we're not like, you know, super realistic. I believe Hot Fuzz was the one that really hammered that home for I me I just watched that movie it was hilarious yeah, so. um <laughs> This, as I said earlier, is a film based on a woman who really was sex trafficked. How do you go about um, sort of honoring her and telling her story as authentically as possible? Because, you know, she's going to see the film someday. She's going to, I guess, have to sort of in some ways relive it. Yeah. How do you sort of go about making a film that she sees and goes like, that's my story, I agree with what you put on camera and I think it sends an important message to people who are going to see it. And uh, that is exactly what she did say. She did see it at the cast and crew screening and again yesterday at the premiere. Um, but I mean, in kind of that was something that was important to me when I was getting started with this. That's why I wanted to. You got a big car. You care about people. You know, I most I, I, people, I know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think you'd be like, "Fuck you! I'm going to do whatever I want with your story." I wouldn't. No. Hollywood. It. That's not particularly my style. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she was like, um, she was available to us. Like I talked to her in prep. Uh, I read her memoir, which is unpublished. Um, and uh, hopefully it will get published. I'm now. sure it will. I have no doubt. And yeah. but uh, you know, because you know, her story is much bigger than this this film. It's goes. It, you know, it starts earlier and it ends later. You know, it's only so um, much you can tell. You and you know, can, what was it? Ninety five minutes, exactly. an hour, forty minutes, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So that all happened. I'm sure. But um, I used that as like you know, I researched through that and through other trafficking films and through other you know books about the subject and basically just tried to get as informed as possible having not ever been through anything like this myself and wanted to just like touch the emotional and physical realities of the of the experience and just make sure I represented that accurately and there was a lot of details that I pulled out of her memoir uh, like Rick did an amazing job of, of including a lot of her like the realities of the situation physical realities in the script and I just pulled out some of the details of of her memoir you raise an interesting question just in terms of the production for me uh, you say that memoirs Unpublished. How exactly did it wind up? In, was it Rick's? Rick's yeah, hands? he like, actually read a, an article in the Korean, a Korean newspaper in, wow. in uh, Los Angeles about Chong. Her story is not that well known. She's no. done some press uh, on the subject. She's a huge advocate for trafficking organizations now, and she has a lot of great work. But um, but she hasn't been like you know she hasn't been like out on the forefront. He read a Korean language newspaper, yeah, how, and how, he like, worked at the Korean Cultural Center in Los Angeles. Wow. So he came across this. He's screenwriter as well so he contacted her and said I would love to write a script about your story and she's agreed and he, she basically wrote the memoir for him to use in the in the writing of this film so wow that's and I was talking to Matt and Jamie also about you know how do you you know go through this production and something that is a, a tough subject matter like I was talking about how you know I love American Beauty. I think American Beauty is a great film, but I totally have to be in the mood to watch American Beauty because I feel so emotionally drained after I watch it. Yeah. And you're basically making a movie for, I don't know, a month, probably, I'm yeah. guessing, about yeah, something that's weeks. a very emotionally draining subject. How do you sort of, you know, 
survive that wake up each day and go like you know let's let's do this because you know yeah there's a good world out there but you know yeah there's all this well i do have a i'm a pretty positive person in general but yeah there was certainly times on this set where it got very serious and we kept, and we all had to like kind of be quiet and respect what 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 jamie and or matt were going through on camera and um and and the crew was super respectful of that but they're also really fun people as you know a lot of them um yeah. and so we actually had a really good time on set everyone just kind of knew when not to you know i, I think people just respected the process and another thing i was talking with them about and you might be able to help differentiate this is that uh I said, you know, this is the kind of thing that a lot of times gets thrown onto a channel like Lifetime and is completely forgotten because, you know, it's, oh, it's one of those movies, you know. But you were able to sort of achieve a film that, you know, had a certain resonance beyond just disposable, you know, entertainment about characters that you never get invested. How exactly did you go about making a film that people would care about about characters who they were really interested in knowing their stories because it, it so often gets forgotten and yeah. I mean maybe it's just because in America or wherever we don't want to know this kind of stuff yeah but you did you made me want to know more and you made me upset about it that's awesome yeah. <laughs> I'm so High glad five. I made you upset <laughs> um, yeah no I mean I think what you're saying is is where is where is the answer it's like I'm only interested in character and relationships and no matter what the genre or what the movie is an audience member if it doesn't have good characters and good relationships I'm not interested so for me that's what makes this film different from a lot of trafficking films that I've seen is that it it's first and foremost about these people um, and the story that the, the trafficking story is the backdrop to these people's lives and uh, and there's, you know, this movie is 90% bad guys. And so a lot of films would, you know, I have a big problem with films that paint bad guys in one dimensional light. And this film, if I'd done that, it would have been a super boring film about a bunch of one dimensional right. characters. So I had to, you know, find these backstories in this life of these all these other people. Well, I, I think that that's a really good point that I've talked about before as well is that, you know, like the film Very Bad Things. I don't like the film Very Bad Things because I find all the characters in it completely unlikable. Yeah. How do you sort of make a film that, as you say, is like 90 percent bad guys into a film that you know is tolerable to someone because it could be so like they're all so awful that you you don't want to watch their story. I mean, is it just that you have this one sort of beacon of hope in it, or is it is there? I a think way it's more. There's more to it than that because Jamie is the she's the audience's like window. She's yeah. the way into this story, but. Um, but I think it's you, you really need to find humanity in all these other characters like Matt's character uh, I think there's enough information in the film for the audience to understand how he landed in this world and for me it's like when I took the script on I had to write my own sort of backstories for everyone just to explain to myself how they landed in this world because there is a there is a way that people find themselves in this situation, whether it's childhood issues or abuse or or whatever. It's just you know, it's it, Matt O'Leary's staring at me. Um. <laughs> so entertaining. You're good. You're too good, he says. You're just too good, and I agree with that. It's true. He's right. Uh, you like they they're able to do their performances and make it engaging. But here's the challenge that you have and the rest of the crew or the producers or whatnot. You got this great film. How do you how do you get it out there? Like it's it's that it's a tough sell. Like it like it's a wonderful film, and I want people to see. It. And you know, doing things like this, I'm sure help a little bit. Yeah. But you still have the challenge of getting this into people's hands. I think once it's in their hands, they're going to enjoy it. But how do you go about you know selling a depressing in some ways uh, story to people? Because you know, so much people just like you know they want to laugh at stupid things like Adam Sandler getting hit in the nuts like how yeah. do you how do you sort of compete with that and make it like our film is one that you're going to want to see well honestly that's one of the things I liked about the way this script was approached from the get-go is that sure it's about a hard subject matter and in a way like it, these kind of movies can be like taking your medicine and I'm learning about something and I'm not going to like enjoy myself but it's also a really like fast-paced 
thriller in a lot of ways, and there's a lot yeah. of entertainment value as, in it. As someone who, who has a, a bad impatience in terms of the pacing of movies, I, for one, appreciated that because I'm often like, let's get let's get this go, keep going, let's move this along. And so yeah. I say good job on that. Thank you. I mean, I'm thinking that's, that is sort of uh, what people are going to respond to about it, and then through that, they're going to have their eyes open to this whole issue, which they probably would have no other reason it, it, to learn anything about. So that's, I feel like you have to have a way to, it's like, you know, provide that information without making it feel like a piece, you know, it's like a medicine. Well, I mean, I, I like that, you know, actually to have the sex traffic E, is that, I don't know if that's the right word for it. Victim, I Victim. usually say. Okay. <laughs> Victim, that seems like a better, a better descriptor, um, be the, the main focus of the movie. Because, you know, something like, I think of like big budget sex trafficking movies, Taken comes to mind. Yep. And that's clearly about, you know, the badass Liam Neeson saving the victims of sex trafficking. Sure. How, how, or at least one of them. <laughs> How do, oh yeah, exactly. Don't really care about the rest of them, sadly. <laughs> kind of depressing to actually think about if you think about that for a moment. But how do you go about, you know, making that your lead character somebody that the audience is willing to, you know, invest their energy in? Because it's 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 like you really do. You have to be willing to sort of look at the underbelly of America and accept, you know, okay, this occurs what exactly is going on how do you like and i mean jamie did a wonderful job so i'm i'm, I'm gonna say that definitely helps but it's sort of like how do you make that underpinning care under i don't know what the term is uh underlying character uh and an engaging movie based around that because it's it's harder to digest so to speak if you will I mean, I think if she was, um, I mean, she kind of hits a point in the, in the early, like maybe the first third of the film where she kind of loses hope. Um, and uh, if that was where the film rested for the rest of it, I don't think people would have been able to stay with her because they need to have that hope. But once they see, once an audience starts seeing her, you know, her mind working and like figuring out her escape route, which takes years for her, but like... There is, like, I think there's a sense that there's a method to what she's doing, and she's working the situation to her advantage and being patient, and then it pays off. And I feel like people latch on to someone who has, who is motivated and uh, is like, you know, being their own hero. Sort of. I mean, so many of these movies, like Taken, is a great example, and it's almost every other film about trafficking, there's a a law enforcement angle where someone swoops in and saves the girl or the girls and in this film one of the things I loved about it from the start was that she has to do it herself yeah, no, no one absolutely. comes no I one's totally looking agree. for her um, I mean I, I just I think it's it makes it much more profound to have it that way because you know if Liam Neeson is the character you're like he's never really in danger he never really has to deal with the, the circumstances that occur I mean so to have her be the lead character is a really profound choice yeah um so that's pretty awesome that you've done this movie. Thanks, uh, Steve. What else is coming up next? Do you have any other projects in the fires that are going to be surprising me and be like, oh, she, she's done another movie? <laughs> I, like, already, I just made a movie since yesterday, actually. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, like you're you're on you're like <laughs> fastly picking up that pace. I do know. I want to I want to spend some time with Eden and and uh, like you know take it through its lifespan, whatever that will be. And um, there's a project that I am. Uh, that went through the Sundance Producers Lab that I wrote wow. that Lacey Levitt um, is producing. Another Seattle yeah. represent. Yeah. Um, but uh, she uh, she went through the Sundance Lab with it and also the Rotterdam Producers Lab and she oh, yeah, I heard and, about that and it's called Sadie awesome. and that, yeah. that might be down the road as well hopefully and uh, we're working on that on the side as well right now um, and uh, just kind of trying to keep the momentum going. I, I, I can't <laughs> wait to be surprised at another point and be like, another Megan Griffiths film. Like, I, I would love to keep surprising you with that. You you are. You are constantly <laughs> surprising me. Um, so where can people find out you know more information? I assume, you know, Twitter? We have a Facebook page. Um, Eden, it's a fan page, so just type in Eden and, okay. and you'll see the poster and come up and that's us. And then uh, Do you have a Twitter I, or anything? I have a Twitter at the Cinechick. 
Um, Isn't that your company as well? Or uh, your, yeah, it's my sort of handle. Pseudonym, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how that happened. It was a it was a fluke choice for a, my first Hotmail account. Yeah. And, yeah. And Those things stuck stick with, with you, forever. yeah, for real. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's at the Cinechick and uh, and and my yeah. you know obviously on Facebook too. So I don't know if you want people just to randomly be Facebooking you. I don't know. I'm sort of getting to the point where I think I might just uh, open the floodgates on Facebook. I think you should create a Megan Griffiths fan page. Oh God. I'd be fan I don't number think one. I could do that. I'd be number too one. Pretentious. <laughs> I'll start it for you. How about that? Okay. And then you'll be like, as long as he does it, it's cool. But yeah. if I do it, I can't do it. Um, well, congratulations with this. I look forward to you know seeing what happens next with Eden and you know everything thereafter. Thank it you, makes sir. me proud to see it. Thank um, you. And you can find more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Thank you. Magneto can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to bite the sun style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.